You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 48. Welcome back. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, it's been a long time in between podcast episodes, and I apologise for that, but we're back into it again uh, for 2016. So, this episode is going to be a QA. Now, I did start recording live QA sessions over on my YouTube channel, which is uh, youtube.com slash Gavin Weber. So if you pop over to that URL, you'll actually see it. But what I've decided to do is to rip the uh, audio file from that Q&A session because it had a lot of valuable information and so many questions uh, from listeners and from viewers on YouTube and listeners here on this podcast that I thought it would be a shame if I didn't put it up on the Little Green Cheese podcast. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining. Hello, my fellow Curd Nerds. And uh, this is going to be the first in the series of Ask a Cheese Maker. Um, I'm going to do about one a month. So look out for those. I'll send through invites via Google Plus and I'll announce it on my YouTube channel as well. But first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsor of the show, which is Little Green Workshops. Uh, just happens to be owned by my lovely wife, Kim, and I. But uh, she's allowed me to take some time off from working to uh, bring this to you. Now, before we start into the questions, and I got quite a few questions from viewers on uh, my YouTube channel and uh, from a couple of uh, cheesemaking groups that I'm, I'm in. So a bit of history about myself. Uh, I've been making cheese since uh, 2009 and... Uh, I learned how to do it at the um, Melton South Community Centre. And there were two lovely ladies, one called Dorothy and the other one called Lorraine, and they taught us how to make cheese. So it was quite an experience. Um, my very first cheese was uh, feta. And the reason I chose to make feta during that cheese making class, because I remember back to uh, when I was a kid. And um, the good thing about that was um, I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in Loxton North in South Australia. Now, the dairy farm's no longer there because uh, they can't irrigate the uh, the paddocks anymore and it wasn't viable. Um, but uh, when I was a kid, uh, we had an abundance of raw milk. It was amazing. So we had all this raw milk. But the funny thing is, my mum and dad didn't know how to make cheese. Um, the closest we got to cheese was butter. And uh, we made copious amounts of that. We also had a separator. So we had skim milk and we also had uh, cream. So lots of that as well. But there were no cultures readily available. However, um, one day when I was um, in my early teens, I went around to my friend George's house. And uh, he was Greek or of Greek descendants. He was born in Australia, but his parents were uh, from the old country. And... Um, they brought out some amazing cheese, um, which just happened to be feta that they'd made themselves. Uh, they'd also made some Greek yogurt, which was tart as anything, but it was it was amazing. There was also Kalamata olives um, and a few other bits and bobs, a little bit of salami, I think, as well. But um, I can remember to this day tasting that salty feta, um, and uh, it just happened to be uh, my choice of cheeses when I first um, started making cheese. Anyway, so what we'll do, we'll get on to, uh, that's a little bit about myself uh, and why I started cheese making and why I'm so passionate about um, cheese making home and bringing all those sorts of things to everybody out there. So the, I've got a swag of questions. I think I will probably go for about 30 minutes. So the first question is from Sharon W. And her question is, uh, my, qu my question is about pressing weights. It seems to me that pressing cheese at home is a bit hiss and hit and miss. I use a press with a screw down arm similar to the one I've seen you using on your videos, but mostly without the spring fitted. Is having the correct amount of pressure applied for the given time in a recipe absolutely critical? 
Well, Sharon, thanks for your question. Well, I think that um, most recipes uh, do need the right amount of weight for the right amount of time. For instance, um, Parmesan is pressed at about 22 kilos, which is 50 pounds uh, of pressure, and it's pressed for over 24 hours, uh, and then it's brined. The reason being is because the curd, uh, once it's once you finish stirring, is really hard, and you need all that pressure to um, to get it to form a wheel of cheese. However, on the other hand, uh, if you've got a softer curd like uh, say feta, um, you don't need much weight um, to press that cheese. For instance, the feta recipe that I've got, and I've got a YouTube video of that. Uh, it only requires two kilos of pressure for four hours. Now, it uh, being a soft curd, uh, what would happen if you pressed it too much? It would um, basically uh, expel way too much moisture, and, and feta is a fairly moist cheese, even after it's been put into brine. So the timings and the times that you flip the cheese over and put it back into the uh, the mould and then press it again, uh, are fairly crucial for those types of cheese. If you want to be authentic to the flavour and type of cheese, then, yeah, follow the directions. Um, I find that the use of a um, – I've got a 50-pound spring or 22-kilo 22, 22 um, spring on my cheese press. I have to um, re-tighten it um, a fair bit um, as the cheese compresses. So to keep that pressure up – I check on it about every six hours and, and give it a couple of twists on the press. Um, if you're using something like a Dutch press, you wouldn't have to worry about it too much. You put the right amount of weight to start with, and it's constantly applied um, onto the the onto the curds. I hope that's answered your question, Sharon. Um, thanks for sending it, sending it in. Now I got one 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 two three four I think from um, Brendan and um, Brendan H. So the first one. Uh, first question he had is when measuring out cultures and spores uh, with those small measuring spoons, I think he's referring to the mini measuring spoons. And he says 132, one, sorry, 132, 132nd and 164th of a teaspoon. Um, I've noticed in your videos that it looks like you're measuring them heaped. Um, I've always wondered, are you supposed to measure them heaped or flat? I've always measured them flat, but when I saw you doing this, uh, doing them heaped, I worried that I may not be, uh, sorry, I may be doing it incorrectly and using the wrong amount. Um, the amount of cultures slash spores you add is important, so I want to make sure I'm measuring correctly. Well, the answer, Brendan, to that one, I believe that, um, uh, and you just have to look on the packet of culture that you're given. It tells you exactly how much milk um, is needed to um so how much culture is needed to coagulate a certain amount of milk? Uh, for instance, some of the uh, the MO30 packet that I have, um, it requires 100 litres of milk to inoculate. Uh, uh, sorry, it needs the amount of culture that's in, I think it's about two grams, if that's a tiny amount of culture and inoculates 100 litres of milk. So what you basically have to do is divide that all up and... Um, you then um, you figure it all out. So the amounts that I use are for the cultures that I use. So if you have a look at the videos, I normally say which type of culture I'm using. Um, I use um, Sacco brand um, cultures. Um, there are certainly others like uh, Danisco Choose It, um, and they have different measurements. Just have a look at the packet. Um, but I tend to use a heap smidgen if I'm making a hard cheese and using the, uh, uh, the Sacco cultures. The second question he's got is, uh, regarding rennet, he said he switched from using rennet tablets to a liquid. Uh, do you know what is the equivalent amount of liquid rennet for a tablet of rennet? Uh, the, li the liquid rennet bottle says I have to use 0.2 mils to 0.5 mil of uh, liquid rennet per litre of milk. Um, this is a significant variation. All the recipes I use refer to tablets. Um, I always use the upper end of the spectrum. Um, but you can never be sure if I'm using the right amount. Well, it just happens that there's actually an international standard for rennet, uh, Brandon, and it's measured in IMCU, which stands for International Milk uh, Coagulating Units. And there's a strength. If you have a look at the bottle of rennet, um, and if you have a look at the bottle of, uh, sorry, the tablets, packet of tablets, 
they have different IMCU per mill. So, for instance, the one that I have, um, it's a, a vegeti, uh, sorry, a vegetarian rennet, and it states on the bottle it's a 190 IMCU. Uh, in, uh, so, it basically, it means um, two mils of milk per 100 litres. Now, on the other hand, the tablets are a lot stronger, and you'll see that the tablets have an IMCU of 2,305 per tablet. So each tablet can inoculate 50 litres of milk. So just check the IMCU strength. Um, I think the suggestions that are on the bottle are fairly okay. Just remember if you're using a, if you're making a soft cheese, you, you tend to use a little bit less rennet. Using a hard, if you're making a hard cheese, then you tend to use a little bit more. Um, not always the case, but check the recipe out. Most recipes, um, all the ones that I have anyway, are all for um, 190 IMCU, um, and which is a standard measure basically for um, liquid rennet. So hope that hopefully that helps out, uh, and you can um, and have a look at that uh, on whatever website you go to now. Just check out the IMCU strength of each of the rennets. And he's got another question. Um, every time he's tried to make goat uh, feta with goat's milk, he has failed dismally. When I check the curd, it breaks cleanly, cuts well, and then when I go to do a gentle stir for 10 minutes before you scoop into the moulds, the curd breaks apart and tends to, and ends up in flecks or broken up curd floating bits around in the way. Um, I've tried resting the curd for five to 10 minutes, then let them heal before stirring, but this made no difference. Should I use more rennet to make the curds more firm and less likely to break apart? Um, goat's milk tends to be a bit of a funny beast, um, and I have used it a few times, and it, ten, it depends on where you're getting your goat's milk from. If you buy it from a supermarket, and I think there's a brand, Paul's brand here in Australia anyway, uh, if you have a look on it, it tends to be ultra-pasteurised. So it's been superheated. Uh, fresh goat's milk works a lot better, obviously. Um, but when you're using um, goat's milk as a rule, you tend to use just a tiny little bit more rennet. And the temperature of the milk when you um, heat it up uh, is a little bit less. So it's a couple of degrees uh, cooler when you add the rennet. Now, I'm not sure what difference that makes, um, but I certainly do know that the goat's milk that you get, it says it's unhomogenized. That's that's all well and dandy um, because uh, goat's milk has smaller fat globules anyway. But most of the milk that you'll find in the supermarket that's marked as goat's milk is ultra pasteurized. So it won't set a curd very well at all anyway. So that may be your problem. Okay. <laughs> and just a quick sip of my cuppa. So the next question is from Brendan again. It's, it's his fourth and final one. So he said, I really want to have a go at making another cheddar. Uh, before I tried, sorry, I tried before and failed. This time I'm going to follow your video tutorial for the farmhouse cheddar. I went looking for green or red peppercorns, but the supermarket didn't have any. Can you use black peppercorns instead? Um, I have tried to use black peppercorns before and I failed dismally uh, because they are just too dry. And when you cut into them, cut into the cheese, it actually rips the cheese uh, once it's mature. So the reason for using green um, or red peppercorns is that they're softer. They're a lot softer in the middle. Um, they haven't been dried out. So the green is best and you can actually get that in most supermarkets. If you look closely, it's in a little green tin. And it's only about yay big, that small, um, by about that round. Um, it's usually made in France, the green peppercorns. Um, but if, if, if you've got your own vine and you live in the tropics, then um, uh, that'll be a lot better. Um, but yeah, green is best. Red is a little bit harder, um, but black is definitely a bit too hard. Uh, the green peppercorns do impart an amazing flavour into, uh, into your cheese. So if you can get them, they're in a little green tin. Um, just go on to one of the online shopping um, that we have here in Australia, Brendan, and, and just search for green peppercorns, and I'm sure they'll come up because I, I can find them quite easily. They're usually in the where all the herbs are um, in the supermarket aisle if you visit some of the uh, major supermarkets that we have here in Australia. So thanks for all those four questions, Brendan. Um, they have been amazing. 
Right, moving on. Um, this is from a uh, another cheesemaker, Warren. Uh, Warren R says uh, he has a question. Um, he's been absent from cheese making for about a year, and he still has the cultures and the vegetable rennet stored in the uh, freezer and fridge, respectively. I'm pretty sure that they have passed their expiry dates, but does it matter? And can I continue to use the ingredients, or should I purchase new? Well, Warren, good question. Um, my rule of thumb is that uh, it depends on how warm the places are that you stored them. Now, you've said you've, set, you've stored them in the freezer and fridge, so that's fantastic. So really, when it comes down to cultures, moulds and enzymes, um, the rule of thumb is that you can store them at room temperature uh, for about one to two months. Uh, they are freeze-dried freeze and sealed after all. Uh, in the fridge, you can store them between six to 12 months. And in the freezer, it slows down the bacterial development. So you can keep them for about two to five years. Now, the bacteria activate when they're in contact with milk. So um, because you've got your cultures in the freezer, I've been using co the same culture, um, and it's a direct vac a vat inoculated or DVI, um, just out of a packet freeze-dried. And I've been using the same one for two years, and I've it still converts the lactose into lactic acid, so it's fine. Um, as for rennet, rennet does tend to go a bit funny um, after about a year. Veggie rennet, not so much. Animal rennet, it does have a shelf life. So make sure that um, if you ever do buy animal rennet, then uh, about 12 months is the shelf life. I've been using the same veggie rennet for about two and a half years, and it still coagulates the cheese, no problems at all. So hopefully that's answered your question. Um, thanks for sending it in, Warren. The next one is from Kerry. Now, Kerry says, Hi, Gavin. Having trouble making hard cheese, being too dry and crumbly. Is this a pH problem? Thanks, Kerry. Um, she's got a second question. It just says, P.S. What is the best type of pH tester to use? And do you do random pH testing during the cheese making process? Well, I think your problem with the hard cheese, and when I first started, I had the same sort of problem, was that I added too much rennet. And by adding too much rennet, it tends to dry the cheese out and it goes crumbly. Um, so make sure that uh, you can adjust the rennet down a little bit. Check how many, uh, what the strength of the rennet is. If it's double strength, um, then you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to reduce the amount of rennet that you're going to use. Um, it is good to check with a pH tester. A lot of recipes in some books um, have the pH of each step, so you can check in your recipe um, where you need to do it. Basically, um, you just check to see if your starter cultures are working. You can use, um, there is pH paper or litmus paper that's specially made for cheesemakers, and it has uh, very slight gradients. Um, so it goes from, I think, 7 down to 4.8 something like that on the pH paper and it has different colours as the, the cheese gets more acidic as the lactose converts into lactic acid. So paper is um, one of the easiest ways. It's the cheapest. You can get a, a handheld pH meter. Um, they do cost about $200. They're not cheap. I have seen some as cheap as 50. Just go on to um, any testing equipment sites and you'll find um, something near you. So so with your hard cheese, just lower the rented amount. Um, and, uh, and you should be right there. Okay, so moving on to some questions from, um, from the YouTube channel. Um, this one's for, from um, Shivdeep, and Shivdeep says, Hi, Gavin, your videos are amazing, especially here for India, where certain cheeses are really expensive, and also for Japan, where I plan to move. I have a question. Can I make um, cheesecake from this cream cheese recipe? If so, will I still need to add salt? Um, also, one more question. I Can I use non-iodized Himalayan pink salt um, because I don't see kosher salt here or cheese salt? Well, your first question, um, Shivdeep, is that, yes, you can use the cream cheese in cheesecake. It gives an amazing flavor. Don't add any salt. The salt is for preservation, basically, and add a little bit of a taste. But if you're going to use it in a sweet cheesecake, then don't add any salt. Um, but for other cheeses, if you're going to use salt, yeah, pink Himalayan salt is fine as long as it's non-iodized. Um, and you can check that out. Um, I actually do have some pink Himalayan salt um, here at home, some very fine stuff. 
Um, but I've never used it in cheese. I actually use it in my soap making and it adds as a bit of an exfoliant. So I think I might try some of that um, in the next cheese that I make. But anyway, thanks for your question. Uh, the next question is from 888 Cabe and he or she says, Hi, Gavin, do you reuse your cheesecloths? If yes, how do you keep them clean between cheeses? Well, yes, I do reuse my cheesecloths, being a bit of a sustainable living advocate. And um, what I do is um, I make sure after they're finished and they're pressed and all that sort of stuff, just give them a bit of a wash in the sink to start with. Then I put them into the uh, front-loading washing machine and um, I don't put any detergent in the in the washing machine, but in the uh, fabric softener compartment, I put in half a cup of white vinegar. Um, so they go on a 30-minute um, cold wash and, uh, and the cheesecloths come out amazingly clean, no sign of cheese stone on them or anything or curds or anything like that. Uh, and they're fresh as a daisy, so I just then hang them up to dry fold them away and then I seal them and once they're dry into a Ziploc plastic bag for use next time. Um, and then I um, sanitize them by boiling them before I start the next cheese session. So that's how you reuse your cheesecloth. Nice and, nice and simple. So this one's from Laura. Laura says, hi Gavin, I live in Queensland. Do you have any suggestions for maintaining a room temperature? of 21 degrees Celsius without air conditioning. Uh, this was posted on the cream cheese video, I believe. So, uh, Laura, yes, I do have a suggestion of maintaining the room temperature at 21 degrees Celsius. Uh, make your cheese in winter when it's cooler. So I don't think you'll have too much problems. Unfortunately, sometimes when the uh, the heat of the room is, is above cheese making temperatures, the only thing you can do is either turn on the air conditioner if you have one, and if not, um, you won't be able to make cheese. So um, most cheeses uh, sit at around 30, 32 degrees Celsius. So if you do have that ambient temperature in your house, then um, stick to something like a, a harder cheese and, and then make sure you pop it into the cheese cave once it's air dried. It won't take long to air dry, that's for sure. Okay, uh, we've been going for 21 minutes, so I've got a couple more. Um, we'll get stuck into those. So this one's from Paul uh, from the YouTube channel. It says, Gavin, well, sir, between your instruction and kind of averaging a few other videos on the subject, I've been making his my first um, brie or cam brie slash blue, which is a Cambenzola. Um, I hope it works. I was able to get my hands on a small bar fridge for ripening. Um, I have my first blue in it and right now, which are despite a few problems, seem to have come out well after all and is quite happily growing. I harvested my culture from a ripened cheese. Fun stuff. question he has, which is not about what he was just talking about, is um, I find it interesting about all this cleanliness stuff that's stressed. Um, I fully understand that having played with mushrooms, um, Okay, fair enough. Um, then I found some videos showing old Italian cheesemakers. They virtually get naked and swim in the curds and weigh by comparison. Uh, it's amazing, and yet they've been up to it for four centuries. Well, I don't think the same bloke's been up to it for centuries. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, look, I think that um, uh, as long as you clean your equipment and, uh, and boil your cheesecloths and... and, and uh, and boil all your utensils, um, then you won't have too much trouble. Just It's better to err on the side of caution. You don't know what, um, well, you do know what you've been preparing in your kitchen, but um, make sure that your area is clean. I wash all my stuff down with um, white vinegar, all the bench tops and all that sort of stuff. I boil all the utensils, uh, all the stainless steel stuff, as well as the cheesecloths. Um, and anything that's plastic, I spray with white vinegar to make sure there's no mold or bacteria on them. So hopefully um, that helps. But I, I tend to make sure that everything is clean and sanitized as best as I can. I don't go overboard. I'm only a home cheese maker. Um, nothing too fancy for that. Okay, next question's from JE. Now, JE says, can you make halloumi making soy? or any other veg slash nut milk. I'd love to see you experiment with vegan cheeses. 
Well, the closest thing I've come to vegan cheese is JE is um, some soy yogurt. I made soy yogurt, uh, which is pretty easy to do. I got a there's a YouTube video for that on my channel, um, but I haven't had a go at making halloumi. I don't think you can um, because the entire process um, needs the curds to be heated to I think it's about 97 degrees Celsius until it floats again. Um, but you can make, um, I have seen recipes for cashew cheese, which looks pretty good. Um, I've also seen some almond milk cheese as well, which doesn't look too bad as well. Um, when I run out of uh, milk cheeses, then uh, yeah, I'll definitely have a go at making a vegan cheese. But there's so many milk cheeses, so I don't know if I'll get around to it. But uh, yeah, check out my um, soy, um, soy yogurt video. But anyway, thanks for the asking the question, J.E. The next one's from Ricardo, and Ricardo says, Hi, Gavin. Have been having a go at cheese a couple of times, and it's great fun and rewarding. I definitely agree there, Ricardo. Um, getting into a bit of harder-style cheeses, um, will they vacuum pack? Sorry, I'll start again. Vacuum packing, will the cheese still mature in the fridge? Well, vac packing is is a new, probably new to cheese making. Certainly for the home cheese maker, I know quite a few people have been doing it for for quite some time, and it's new to me anyway. So, I it's probably the last thing I would do if if you've got the right humidity and the right temperature in your cheese making fridge, then see if you can get a rind to develop naturally, and just wipe it every couple of days with some um, a cloth dipped in brine. That always works really well. Um, if you can't do that, then then wax the cheese, if, especially if it's only a small round and it's under a kilo or, or about a kilo, then wax your cheese. It tends to breathe a little bit better and, and you get a little bit less seepage. And vacuum packing um, excludes all the air and, and cheese is a living thing. So it kind of needs a little bit of air to, uh, to grow properly and, and all the flavours to develop. Uh, but if you do vac pack, then make sure that you... Um, you age it for about a month more, especially if it's a hard or a semi-hard cheese. So it will take more time to develop the flavour. Um, I've had some good success with some of the longer age cheese, especially like um, Parmesan or Romano, because I find if I wax those, um, then they tend to dry out under the wax. So um, I only make small one kilo wheels of those two cheeses and they age for up to a year, um, sometimes longer. So just make sure um, if you do vacuum pack, then it's cheeses that uh, mature for a long time. I hope that answered your question, Ricardo. Thanks for sending it in, mate. Okay, the next one is from uh, Stephanie. And Stephanie says, Hi, Gavin. Greetings from Washington State, USA. I love your cheese making videos. Well, I love making them, Stephanie. Um, I have a question about mold on my Stilton. Uh, I followed your video making the Stilton a few months ago. I placed two small wheels in their own plastic cheese cave. Uh, away from the other cheeses in my fridge. Initially, I scraped the blue mould off the sides, top and bottom of the wheels every week. Um, now I have a orange and pink coloured mould growing. Um, I have been scraping this off also once a week. Is this cheese a total loss? What is the pink orange slash mould? Um, well, I'll stop there for a second. Um, the um, the mould is called, and it's a naturally developed mould, sometimes it's on a washed rind cheese, it's called um, Brevi Bacterium Lien, and uh, it's used for Munster cheese. It does have a bit of a, a smell to it, but it is a normal mould. I don't worry too much about the mould colours as long as they're not black. Now, black mould on a cheese um, is, uh, is not very good for the cheese. It makes it taste horrible. Um, it is slightly toxic, so as long as you're not getting black mould, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you go and have a look at some of the YouTube videos um, where they're making Stilton with the, the massive, the massive big wheels of Stilton, I think they're about 40 kilos, have a look at the mould growth on the outside of those cheeses. There are blues, pinks, greens, oranges, all sorts of mould colours, and that cheese is perfect. It's sent commercially to market, so... Don't worry too much about the mold colour as long as it's not black um, or a tinge of grey. Um, yeah, it, you've naturally got moulds and bacterias in your cheese cave because you've been making cheese for, for 
for a while by the sounds of it. So don't be too fussed about it. I think your sanitation was okay. Uh, it just sometimes these cheeses get contaminated with all sorts of yeasts and bacteria from all over the place. So um, keep working at it. I think that your cheese will probably be okay. My first Stilton had a bit of orange um, mold on it. Um, I just kept um, scraping it off and it was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. It tasted amazing. Hopefully answered your question, Stephanie. Okay, we've only got a couple to go. So the next one is from, this one's from Joe. Um, and Joe says, hello, Gavin. I made your Wensleydale cheese last March, waxed it, kept it in a cave at 54 Fahrenheit, which is 13 degrees Celsius. Um, he doesn't know the humidity level. Um, it doesn't really matter when you're waxing as long as it's a little bit higher than um, about 50% if you've got it waxed. Um, he opened it at New Year's and out poured about 10 mil of liquid um, from in between the cheese and the wax. No foul smell. The consistency of the cheese was crumbly like uh, blue cheese, but creamy, but then would not slice, just stuck to the knife halfway between a cream cheese and a Wensleydale. Tastes great though. Um, do you have any suggestions? I use the recipe from your ebook. Uh, enjoy your blogs and cheese making. Thanks, Joe. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I think that the, the issue may have been a little bit too much rennet um, because I've had this experience when I first started making cheese um, and I haven't had it since. I did have, I think it was a farmhouse cheddar, well, the very first one I made and I didn't use really good quality milk and you, you don't say in your question what, what type of milk you use. I used commercial store-bought milk and I used... So I had to use a bit of calcium chloride to fortify the milk so it had some soluble calcium so it would set a proper curd. And it was just plain off-the-shelf supermarket milk that had been normally pasteurized and homogenized. And I found that that type of milk, as I aged my farmhouse cheddar, tended to gather um, liquid between the, um, the wax and the cheese. And you're right, it doesn't smell bad. Um, all I did was, once I took the wax off, um, basically I just wiped it down with a, um, with a paper towel or patted it down with a paper towel on, on the, around the cheese. Um, and then, um, and then ate it and yeah, it was crumbly. All right. But i tell you what, it was lovely, delightful flavor. Um, so it depends on the quality of the milk. I think maybe a little bit too, too much rennet in this case, if it's really crumbly. Um, so see if you can get the best quality milk when you're making a your cheese. I tend to try and find, um, I use biodynamic milk, um, which is, there's a brand here in Australia called Dimiters. Um, so that's, that's better than organic as far as they say anyway. And I find I get amazing curd set and the best flavored cheeses. And I never have any issue with, you know, liquid coming out of wax or anything like that. And, uh, and the flavor development is, is just amazing. So try and get the best possible milk. If you can get access to raw milk, even better. Fantastic. You won't need to use any calcium chloride or anything like that when using raw milk. And you'll find that the flavors are amazing. So hopefully that's answered your question, Joe. All right. Um, two to go. So this one's from Sherelle. Sherelle said, I've just followed your recipe for raw milk halloumi using raw goat's milk. I had to reheat the whey after 45 minutes to bring the blocks to the surface and left for 15 minutes as the recipe stated. Uh, when dipped and tried to roll, the block broke. No elasticity at all. Any clues? Well, um, I when I made my recipe for halloumi, I actually used um, raw milk, raw cow's milk. So um, that's what I adapted the recipe for. So if you use goat's milk, um, which you seem to have, and I know they make um, halloumi, proper halloumi out of, a combination of goat's and cow's milk, um, maybe using a little bit less rennet in this example because goat's milk tends to not need as much rennet. Um, so that, that's the only suggestion I can think of. Um, and make sure that when you do add your rennet that the temperature is a, little, a couple of degrees less. And I've said this before in a previous question, um, but it certainly helps. It certainly does. So hopefully that answers your question and, uh, and helps out. So the next one is the last one, and this is quite interesting. This one's from Tammy, and Tammy um, sent me this question via an email. 
says, hi, Gavin, I found you about eight months ago and think you're doing a great job. I have a blog called Gippsland Unwrapped, and you may know of the town Warrigal. Warrigal's in Gippsland here in, in Victoria, which is the largest city centre that I'm close to. I just wanted to know if it's possible to make cheese without single-use plastic. She wants to get into cheese making, um, but she's a bit um, cautious. She's trying to live a plastic-free life. Good thing is that um, she has one major advantage, and that is she lives on a dairy farm and doesn't need to buy milk in plastic bottles. Just wondering if you have any solutions. Well, Tammy, the equipment and stuff that I use, everything's stainless steel. Um, the only plastic I use is plastic molds. So they're, um, uh, what are they, low density polyethylene. So they're plastic number two and they're readily recyclable. So they're not single use. So I use them over and over. In fact, I'm using since 2009 the same molds. So the same baskets or molds that I've been using um, previously. So you certainly don't throw those away. The only thing that you may have trouble with very hard to get around is the packages that the cultures come in, the cultures and molds. They are those, um, they're in the, uh, the, the aluminium foil coated plastic containers. So they're a, a typical freeze dried thing. It's got a, uh, a Ziploc top um, that you can reseal over and over again. However, once, the, once you finish the culture and the mold, you don't have much choice except to, um, to throw it away and it's not recyclable. The only thing I can think of, if you're going to make some um, cheeses, you can make your own starter culture. There's a new book out. Um, I'll just... Uh, there's a new book out by David Asher, uh, which is Natural Cheese Making, and he, uh, he has techniques in that book, and he's coming to Australia soon, actually, um, to Melbourne, um, and I know he's, in, he's going to be in Sydney as well, and he's going to teach people, I think it's a two-day cheese-making course. It's about $360 Australian. I don't know, he's done courses throughout the US and Canada. And basically, he grows his own cultures. So he grows the cultures or use natural cultures from the air around us. So I know he, he creates Penicillium Rogue 40. He grows it on rye bread, which is the, the way they traditionally make uh, Roquefort cheese in France. They develop... Um, the blue mold on rye bread and add it to the cheese. So see if you can get your hands on that book. It's called uh, natural cheese making by David Asher. Um, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, I don't have a copy myself, but I'm looking forward to uh, grabbing one soon. So if you can make your own cultures or be using raw milk anyway, that has a lot of starter culture, but has the right bacteria in it um, that, you probably won't need to use or buy cultures and you may be able to grow some yourself. So check out that book and, uh, and see what you can come up with. Well, that's all the questions I've got. And I've been waffling on for about uh, 36 minutes. Um, I'd like to thank all the viewers that have popped in and out and had a, um, a, a watch of the show. This show will go up on to YouTube as soon as it's finished, um, after it's finished being live broadcast. So I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Um, and we'll do it again in about a month's time. So if you have any questions, um, just make sure that you shoot them through. So pop over to um, www.littlegreencheese.com um, and you can use comments or you can use the contact form on there to send through a question and I'll read them out on air and hopefully give you some suggestions. Um, remembering I'm only a humble home cheese maker that's made uh, quite a few cheeses in his time. And I'm just using experience and research to make sure that I answer um, your questions to the best of my ability. So anyway, thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you next time. See you later. Well, I hope you all got a bit out of that. Um, I enjoyed the live show. There's a few more ums and ahs than are normally in this show, uh, which I usually edit out, but uh, I left them for dramatic effect. Anyway, if you are after any cheese making supplies or kits you can pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au who i did say at the start of the show is the sponsor for this episode that is owned by myself and my lovely wife and we try and get as many affordable cheap making cheese making supplies out there to our listeners and our viewers on uh, the podcast and the youtube channel uh, and you can check out the cheese making section there 
So I've also been busy, just a little brief at the end, I've been busy making cheese making videos. So there are quite a few on the site now. Um, one of my favourites was uh, Chili Queso Fresco. Um, it's a bit of a hit in some of the cheese making groups that I'm in. Uh, people really do enjoy making it and eating. It's nice and quick. It can be consumed in the same day. Um, so see if you can find that video over at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gavin Webber. So go and have a look at that when you've got a spare moment. You've been listening to Little Green Cheese. To leave a listener comment, please do so over at littlegreencheese.com. Um, you can find all of the upcoming workshop dates and all of my recipes over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my cheese making ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, A Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. Now that's all available in all ebook formats uh, and you can find further details over on the site. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin MacLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. See ya.